Okay, as promised, here is the long-awaited code walkthrough for my NeoPixel computer lighting project, also known as the DIY Hue Plus. Before watching this, I recommend that you check out the build vlog video for the project, which will be linked down below in the description. Let's jump right in, though, to the Arduino IDE, which we have opened up right here. For this walkthrough, I'm going to be go going basically line by line so that you can get a good idea of what everything means. So to jump right in, first off, we're declaring the Adafruit NeoPixel library at the top, followed by uh, declaring the pin that the NeoPixel strand is attached to on the Arduino, uh, which in this case is digital pin six. Now next we're gonna declare a few more things here. And the first three are for the MSG EQ7 chip, which is the IC in the circuit, which has the functionality of a seven band audio spectrum analyzer. And they're all declared as integers because they'll have to be called as such later in the code loop down below, which we'll get to. Uh, but first up is the analog pin, which reads the analog audio data on analog pin zero on the Arduino, uh, followed by the strobe pin on pin 10 and the reset pin on pin 11 on the Arduino. Now, after that, I'm declaring some non-hardware constants, which you can see right here. These are also all integers as well, so they can work in the loop code. Uh, first is the spectrum value, which is an array. You can tell by the little brackets here. Uh, and it's holding seven frequencies in the audio spectrum that are read by the analog pin. Now, next up is spectrum read, which you'll notice is equal to an equation that basically means it will hold whatever the analog value is that's being registered on the analog input pin from the MSG Q7 through the Arduino. And finally, we have the pulse width modulation value, which is being sent to read the previously declared spectrum read. Uh, this code requires a lot of stuff to be constantly read while constantly being applied to cause kind of chain reaction events. So that's why there are all of these declared values. They're basically values of each other. You can see how like spectrum read is linked to pulse width modulation value, but to get spectrum read, you have to analog read analog pin. What's analog pin? It's up here. So it's all really closely connected and it may seem a bit repetitive and kind of like almost infinite loopy, but it's it all works later down in the, the loop. Uh, but then we have a constant integer down here, uh, which is declared for 60, which is for the 60 individual LEDs that are on the NeoPixel strand that I'm using. And that's just part of the NeoPixel setup. Now, we're gonna get into some fun stuff here. So for the frequency reactions on the NeoPixel strand, I wanted every seven LEDs to react to a different frequency. So for example, the first one would react to the lowest frequency or 63 Hertz. The second one would react to the second lowest frequency or 160 Hertz and so on and so forth until the eighth pixel, which would begin the pattern again and react to the lowest frequency. So this was so that I could get a more reactive look on the NeoPixel strand that's going throughout um, the entire PC case. Uh, so that wouldn't kind of all be going off at once or have one end of the strands be all low end and as a result like hidden. Um, so think of it as like groups of seven throughout the entire strand. So to do this, I made arrays of arrays, which can turn your brain inside out a bit. So I'll try to explain this as clearly as possible. It'll probably help if we actually jump ahead a bit to the arrays of arrays portion and kind of work backwards. So here we are here. Um, so you'll notice as I've set up arrays that are groups of seven. Um, and this is to create the groups of seven frequency reactions that I just described. So basically think of it like each pixel is representing one um, frequency group and that's kind of repeating throughout the strand. And then if we scroll down, I actually, I end with a group of four uh, because of division and the total number of pixels, which are 60. So, but each of these, all the others have groups of seven pixels that have been declared previously um, to assign a physical pixel number. So if we scroll back up, you'll see in these squiggly brackets, um, pixels zero 
to 59 because that's a 60 in binary and they're all accounted for and assigned to a group now i defined them in this way so that in the loop for the code it's a lot more simplified which cuts down on reaction time and also allows me the flexibility to take the analog input from the chip and more easily disseminate it into the pixels to get the desired effect so as you can see here here's the first group of seven and it's taking band one band two band three um and if we go back up here Band 1 is 0, band 2 is 1, band 3 is 2, so on and so forth. So all of those are grouped into the larger bands array. And then if we go up here, band one, band A1 is 7, band A2 8, so on and so forth. Scroll back down here, bands A has all of those pixels grouped in here, and that's how they all are laid out. Uh, now next up, something a little bit more simple. Um, we're at some Adafruit NeoPixel library setup. Uh, this will always vary for your strip. Um, but notice I'm plugging in length and pin, which were previously declared. So that, so pin was way back up here, pin six, NeoPixel pin, and length, constant integer length, 60 they're all set down here so I don't have to actually put in individual numbers. And now we're at void setup. This is starting to get like deeper into the code. Everything else was just telling the code like, okay, these are things we're gonna be using for the entire time. You've got to remember these for the entire time. So for the setup, first we're setting up the MSG Q7 chip uh, to have its pins reset to their default states. And then we're declaring some NeoPixel things. So these are all the the resets. As you can see, I put some notes in, puts pins in default state and everything like that. Um, and then we have some NeoPixel things again. Uh, and this is for brightness, 60% brightness. Um, and that'll keep the light as 60% brightness always. Um, and then strip.begin kind of initializes the strip and strip.show, it kind of like resets the pixels. And we'll actually repeat this command later in the loop just as a way to kind of refresh the pixel. And now for the main event, the loop. Now this is um, the part that will continuously run. Uh, first, we're gonna turn on the reset pin to high, throw in a quick delay, and then digital right reset pin low. This is just kind of doing the classic IT thing of turning it on then off again, just to kind of reset it and get it into a, a nice default state. Um, just kind of cleans things up so that data isn't gonna crash into itself, uh, which is really important with the MSG Q7 chip. Um, awesome little chip, but it's taking in so much data that it just, it kind of needs to refresh itself a lot or else it's gonna, it's gonna give out some jarbled gunk and you won't get the clean frequency reading that you're looking for. But now we're gonna go into a for loop. Uh, now we're declaring integer i equals zero, i less than seven, i plus plus, uh, so meaning that it will increase. Uh, and if you guess this was related to the frequencies, you're totally right. Now let's get into the body of the for loop. Uh, once again, we reset the strobe pin, uh, this time turning it off. And we're gonna call up one of our declared integers from before, uh, pulth with modulation value, or PWM value for short. And so with this map statement, we're actually converting analog data to digital data. We're saying that spectrum read is gonna be a value that is could be putting out a minimum of zero to 1024, which is the minimum and maximum in analog. And we're actually converting it to digital. So basically we're setting zero to zero and 1024, the max analog value to 255, which is the max digital value, which leads us to another if statement. So we've got an if statement nestled within the for statement. And it's saying that if PWM value is less than 50, you're gonna take the value and set it to be equal to itself divided by Two. And as the notes 
uh, say, this is a noise filter so that you'll get a cleaner representation of what frequencies are actually coming through. You don't need to, in this case, see every little spike because it's kind of more for an aesthetic, so that's why you're putting that in there. And then we got a quick delay. And that's the main portion of the code for the MSG Q7 chip. Uh, so now we're going to get into telling the NeoPixels what to do with the data from the chip. So first, we're going to start with this byte hue uh, valuation. So we're saying that hue is basically going to be worth uh, one byte of information. And this is so that it can be passed in the RGB color declarations later since each RGB value or percentages of red, green, and blue are each worth one byte of information. Now I'm using a constrain and map function statement to define the value of hue. Uh, first we're going to look at the map function. Okay. Uh, and the variable is the analog value of P, W, M value. And that's why analog read. So we're going to look at this as an analog value, uh, which is basically the level of the frequency being read by the MSG EQ7 chip. The frequency ranges were split out and declared in the previous portion of the loop, but this is looking at pure volume, basically. The map function here is doing a similar thing to the previous map function that declared the value of PWM value. Now since PWM value is being passed here in this map function as an analog value with the analog read statement, the values are once again being converted from analog to digital. So zero analog here equals zero digital, but then 400 analog equals 100 digital. But this time with a smaller range. And this is to make the lights more sensitive to the dynamic range that was filtered in the previous portion of the code. So now we're getting like almost a more compressed version of the frequencies so that it will translate a little bit better um, to be represented as color. Now the values within the map statement are then literally constrained by this constraint function. Uh, sometimes code isn't so cryptic. It's actually doing what it says it's doing. Set of parentheses is going to fall between a value, a digital value range of zero to 255. Uh, now, while this is still digital in nature, hue is going to be passed as a color in the RGB declarations next. So zero to 255 is going to be acting as a color amount, basically. And speaking of colors, you probably noticed this fairly large block of code here. Um, this is the actual color portion of the code. Now, since my computer has a purple and blue theme going, I wanted the lights to match, obviously. So I've dialed in a more kind of pinkish purple as the default, since it brightens up the case a bit. Uh, the analog values being read by the MSG Q7 chip are being translated visually to the strip by the pinkish purple becoming kind of a deeper purple slash blue, depending on how intense the frequency readout is. And I'm setting the colors for each array that was declared at the beginning of the script using the standard NeoPixel library command for strip.setPixelColor. Um, and then you see the bands, bands A, bands B, which was way back at the top there. Now inside the command, you'll notice um, that I have some brackets next to these because I did set these up as arrays. And inside the bracket, I have the letter I. And this is calling the integer declared back at the beginning of the loop in the for statement, which is triggering the data from the MSG Q7 chip for the seven frequencies. It's assigning the different frequencies in order from low to high to the seven pixels that were defined in the arrays that are now in these kind of arrays of arrays. So it's all kind of linked together. So just to kind of explain it just a little bit further, we have this array here, these individual numbers for the pixels that are being put into this group here. And then that group calls upon the seven frequencies declared here so that it can translate it to assign those frequencies to the individual pixels. 
Now after that, we use the NeoPixel library command for color, which is stripped.color. And then this will vary for the type of color you're trying to dial in, but for the effect I wanted, I have a value of 80 for red, zero for green, and then 255 for blue. And you're gonna want to play around a bit to see what works, even look up some RGB color kind of codes online, see how they translate for you. Um, it takes a little bit of dialing in, and also it's all personal preference as well. Notice in the blue value here, I have 255 plus hue. Um, and by doing this, I'm actually adding the analog values to the default pink color to get the PWM effect from the audio to represent the frequencies. So basically you have the base color and then this kind of extra color is going to affect the baseline color to kind of think of it as like kind of making it deeper and the higher um, volume on a certain frequency band, the, the deeper blue that individual pixel will be. And then to finish things off, there's a slight delay here uh, to avoid everything from crashing into each other because keep in mind, all of these commands here in this loop, they're gonna be running constantly. So if you aren't letting it breathe, then the colors are gonna glitch out. And I say this from experience in messing around with this code. And then from the final command, we once again do a digital write to strobe pin uh, to prepare it to reset for the next loop. And then that bracket closes out our for statement, which is right up here, you can see the box showed up here. Um, and then that's followed by strip.show, uh, which is again from the NeoPixel library to literally show the pixel colors. Um, again, code isn't always cryptic, just most of the time. And then another delay at the end here, this, this one a little bit longer uh, to avoid any glitching. When it comes to coding with hardware, I don't think you can ever have enough delays, to be honest, especially in prototyping. It lets you see exactly how the code is affecting the hardware, and it makes everything a lot easier to understand and in the beginning stages fix. But that's a wrap for this video. Uh, click the thumbs, drop comments, not bombs, follow me socially, Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, and Twitter. Thank you for watching, think about subscribing, and until next time, this has been Blitz City DIY.